Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today's podcast is for Transfiguration Sunday, February 19th, 2023. And our text will be Exodus 24, verses 12 through 18, Psalm chapter 2, 2 Peter verse chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And we continue our reading in, Gos- in the Gospel of Matthew, but we are moving to the 17th chapter, uh, reading verses 1 through 9. Happy, happy Transfiguration. No, <laughs> there we are. No longer an epiphany. Happy, happy trans, uh, Transfiguration Sunday. And the exciting thing about the text chosen for the special holy the holy days is that they are pointed in a way that their interactions are clearer than some of the lectionary readings. So um, uh, that we can kind of, we're, we can, we can hit the transfiguration um, through all of the text today. Uh, just keeping that central. Well, it's, you know, this happens every year. <laughs> We get uh, the story of the transfiguration, and I think we always comment on, you know, preach the text, not the the, the festival. But I, I also I think this year my thought is how does trans how does the story of the transfiguration contribute to what Epiphany is all about? And so mm, the idea yes. of how will the Messiah be manifested to the world? And as we began this traditionally with the the story of the Magi mm-hmm. who come and, and visit Jesus. Now, of course, it's, who knows, 30 years later, and Jesus is a full-grown adult and has followers and has just started talking about how he's going to be tortured and killed and then rise again. So that six days later at the start of the passage is so important that, that mm-hmm. we're still in the midst yes. of this radical shift in the gospel and a sense of where the story is is heading. And so I think it it deserves some conversation. What does it mean for Jesus to be manifested? I'm doing air quotes here uh, for those mm-hmm. watching on not, not watching on YouTube. What does it mean for Jesus to be manifested, to be epiphanized? Just created the word there. Mm. Um, through through well, through that's... suffering and through death and through resurrection, because that's where the gospel is going to start to point us there. Mm. At the same time, you've got this glorification. We think that's what's going on in this scene. Um, but it's both, right? But I think the I think the point of the epiphany or the, I'm sorry, of the transfiguration is largely to reaffirm Jesus's own sense of his identity and mission now that he's talking about an upcoming passion. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we often see the cross as something to get over <laughs> so we can get to right. Easter. Mm-hmm. And there's something about the suffering on the cross that is so crucial to manifesting this king. Yeah. To use language again from Matthew too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would point folks to uh, the commentaries this week for each of the verses. Um, uh, I, I particularly think that they do just that uh, in terms of acknowledging the text and what the text is saying. But for that very reason, uh, for that answering that very question that, that you've lifted before us, and how is this um, helping us to understand the the ministry of Jesus uh, in this status, um, which um, in, in this particular moment uh, in in Matthew is momentarily exposed to uh, to um, Peter, James, and and John. Um, I sometimes like to say Jesus is three buddies. Um, you say he's exposed uh, to them? <laughs> oh, gosh. Thanks for hearing that and repeating it. <laughs> Sorry, just adding a little humor to our transfiguration. I did do that, didn't I? Yeah. Um, um, let me say revealed. <laughs> And that now in that context is just as problematic. Um, But um, with the clarity of his status and role, uh, there's a broader revelation of Jesus's true identity as Messiah, which uh, is is beyond. One of the commentaries uh, makes this clear. 
um, it, it's beyond um, uh, the expectation. I think Joel makes this, uh, Lamont makes this when he's when he's talking about um, a song, but that this 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 is a confusing way of thinking of what they thought the promised Messiah would be. Mm-hmm. And this is also a confusing way to think of what it means to be king, um, uh, to, to, to have power. Uh, and, and so we're going to get, the, I, I think you're right, it deserves to, it deserves some, some fleshing out in terms of everything that they were expecting is turned upside down to give them exactly what was promised. And in some ways, it's what we were talking about uh, uh, last week uh, in understanding what is the law. Everything that we've become familiar with may not be truly fulfilling the law. And and so this is a this is a revelation that comes not from what they know, but what from God reveal what God reveals. Mm-hmm. I <coughs> pardon me. I think too the that the context is really, as we've just said, the context is really important because it comes six days later. It comes on the heels of, of course, the first passion prediction in Mm -hmm. verses Mm -hmm. uh, chapter 16, 21 to 23, and then the cross and self-denial. And then six days later, you have the transfiguration. And Mm -hmm. I, I, one of the things that I, that I thought about that I appreciated about the commentary with Ron, uh, with Ron Allen, that I kind of had an inkling toward, but, uh, but, it, but the commentary helped me a little bit is that the way in which the transfiguration functions to, uh, to, uh, upend mm-hmm. our expectations mm-hmm. of what Jesus is up to and what God is up to that i uh, that you know that that we have this it, this this foretelling of the of the death of Jesus but we also have it's you know we have okay we have the passion predictions but they're also resurrection predictions right right and so the uh, he will be raised and and but yet, what does that mean? And what is that going to look like? And nobody can really understand that. And somehow the transfer, the transfiguration is like a, a foreshadowing of of resurrection, and uh, and and this the the glory of the of the resurrection that can't be that can't really be described or can't really be you know how do we get our heads around it that somehow the transfiguration is like an an encapsulation of 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 what god can do and what god can do next and i yeah. uh, and that's not explainable but you just sort of just sit in the glory and sit in the dazzlingness uh, and and in part that's kind of the experience of the resurrection right that the that the women at the tomb uh, are afraid uh, with with the with this revelation of the angels and uh, and so I think there there's something there I was uh, in surprisingly too I felt myself I felt myself thinking again a lot I, and I'm talking about this a lot but it's kind of where I am but I, I felt myself thinking a lot about my dad with this passage with the transfiguration in that um, in that you know, I looked at his body, you know, when he was dying and I thought, um, you know, what is that promise of, of a, a being, you know, being transformed and transfigured and resurrected and that, that there's something really theologically, uh, it's, it's glorif it's glorifying and it's magnificent, but there's something so like, something so theologically promising and that God is about metamorphosis, that God is about transfiguring transformation uh, that has everything to do from going from death to life. And somehow the transfiguration captures that, that promise of God of moving, of, of making life out of death. 
is kind of where I was going. And I, it's not, it's never anything I've thought about when it comes to the transfiguration before. So I was like, wow, you know, but um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, that's kind of where I was with this, especially going into it's Lent, a, you know, going yeah, into Lent. Yeah, it, and that and we, a, uh, we so, lit, we so, I think it's a really helpful corrective to the way in which we think of the cross and resurrection far too linear, linearly. <laughs> uh, is that a word? You I think say that. that. But, you know, it, we've got the cross and then the resurrection, cross and resurrection. And some of the work that I've been doing uh, over the last couple of years is how much more we need to be talking about the resurrection, but with the cross remaining. Uh, that yeah. That what happens when when there is a traumatic event, when death happens, that it, the, the, that death is what remains and you live in the promise of the resurrection, but there, now there's an integration, there's an inter, interrelatedness of death and life that you, that you can't, it's not, it's not that you move on and go from one to the other. And so I think that's what the transfer, transfiguration does. It throws this like life, life altering metamorphosis transfiguration in the midst of death um that reminds us that this is not this is not a linear process uh this is not a, a god this is not a linear reality that we're now going to go through through lent uh and i think that's really important too i like that right the 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 line between life and new life is very thin and maybe even permeable at times and so like mm -hmm. you said the linear way of thinking is Kind of like paul in first corinthians 15 right this is the process mm -hmm. which is of course how most of us i imagine experience it but for jesus it's this new life bursting in peter gets criticized for offering to build the tents mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons but and but peter's thinking like well this is what moses did moses went on yeah. the mountain moses hung out for 40 days in the cloud and then came back down and right we know the story about the face and the the glory Mm -hmm. fading and all of those things that's linear and the response yeah. you know well god doesn't say we don't need any tents but <laughs> i think that's implied but the, because it's going to happen the dwelling the glory isn't going to stay here on the mountain the glory is going to yeah. now be embodied in this crucified one who's going to look anything but glorified of course when he's hanging yeah. on the cross right but like you said also the resurrection doesn't erase crucifixion or doesn't somehow make that a, a hurdle to get over I think I'm just saying the same thing you said, Caroline, but yeah, it's a credit it's, for it's it. That, <laughs> well, well, let me, let me get on this train. Um, it's uh, oh, yeah. because you take credit for it, Joy. <laughs> I'll take credit for it. Uh, it's the reigning power um, doesn't come with military might or, or political posture or even cynical campaigns. And yet it is a power that outstrips that of any power of that of any leader that of any king mm -hmm. um and how does it come and this is why what you're saying is is important you know we can we can just have this moment of glorification we can just have this this um a proclamation of resurrection but paul said i have nothing to preach but christ crucified and this is six days later as you said as after jesus has spoken about this upcoming passion. And so how is God's power going to be exhibited? Well, it's gonna be exhibited through Jesus emptying himself totally of power. Um, it's, it's, it's gonna be exhibited uh, as him being the servant and, and the servant who suffers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's uh, the, the, the servant who suffers a humiliating public execution. Mm -hmm. It's going to be exhibited in a ragtag community of outcasts who choose to proclaim the promises of the creator God. Mm -hmm. This is not what they thought the promised Messiah mm -hmm. King would look like. Mm -hmm. And yet this is the very way that God topples the powers of the world to show the majesty and glory and shalom mm -hmm. of the creator. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, two of the things that came to mind with the transfiguration this year, one is you said, Matt, that Peter often gets, a, you know, criticized for wanting to build a tent when that's exactly, you know, <laughs> what happened in the Exodus. Not a bad idea. <laughs> no, it's, you know, but it... You know, to hold on to Jesus' presence, uh, but but when you connect it back to the Exodus, the tent, of course, was the location of God, and so right. so how is it that here, that's part of what Peter's realization is, is that that somehow God is here. Uh, and I want to hold on to that uh, in this on this mountaintop experience. But then, as you said, Matt, that but the God is going. God is now, God is present in Jesus and, and will continue to be present in Jesus throughout the rest of Matthew. The other thing I wanted to say is that we, you know, we talk a lot about the transfiguration as manifesting the glory of God and the identity or the glory of G God, the glory, uh, the glory of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, the affirmation of Jesus. Sometimes I wonder too, if and I think the commentary maybe alluded to this or read it somewhere, I don't know, but that uh, how much Jesus needed to hear these words yeah. as much as everybody else needed confirmation of the words. Jesus heard these words back at his baptism. He's just foretold what's going to happen. And now he hears again, you, you know, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And so there's something I think there's something there too that 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 Jesus hears an affirmation of his identity exactly when he needs to hear it, uh, yeah. and as 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 we continue to move forward in this gospel, uh, that that now Jesus Jesus is again yeah affirmed of of who, of who he is, and that's those are. Those are words that he needed to hear again, that we need to hear again. We can't hear just once or twice or, <laughs> and, and, and the fact that it, and the, the fact that he hears these words directly after that first passion prediction, I think is, I think is an important location, location for the transfiguration and that, and that promise to Jesus himself. If, if, if I, if I throw in a little Hebrews, the humanity of Jesus, who was tempted in every way that we were, mm -hmm. um, yeah. How, how do you how do how do you survive, or how do you uh, how are you sustained when you you are remembering or are recognizing the trials you are about to encounter? Mm -hmm. It's knowing that God has you in the center of God's hand, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what this is. And 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 Caroline, um, in your first point. Um, and I think Matt was the one who used the, the word first about the tenting. Um, I'm just going to do a little John insert here <laughs> is that, yes, God is with us, but sorry, Peter, God isn't up here on the mountain, but God is walking with us down back in the valley. So Jesus with us, God with us. And that's really what this is all about. Yeah, it's a, it's a restatement of God, Emmanuel. E Emmanuel, yes. Mm -hmm. You just made Caroline's epiphany by bringing in John 1 there. I thought I'd do that. She's having such an impact on me. One of our listeners would say that was epiphantastic. Epiphantastic, <laughs> right. Yeah, that was awesome. Way to go. That was uh, Amanda, one of our Amanda, listeners. Anyway. Amanda, Apple Hands, awesome. Yes, epiphantastic. That's right. Uh, the Psalm two, I mean, can we jump to the Psalm? Or am I skipping too quick over Exodus? Which of course is chosen because it says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. But you were talking earlier, Joy, about the the, the inversion of expectations of kingship. And, mm -hmm. and Joel Lamont is, always writes good commentaries for us. And this is really yeah. helpful talking about Psalm 2, that it's not just about you are my son and, and you know God speaking that, but it's about the vision of power that, Yes. We're getting in this Jesus and the vision of power we might want. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I want a glowing king on a hillside, although that sounds interesting some days when I read the news, you know, but it's the cross will look anything but yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, there will appear to be no glory anywhere in sight, especially in Matthew's version, like Mark's version. And mm -hmm. so to hold on to this through Lent and to be offended by it on Good Friday is, I think, a, 
part of the preaching task, you know, to, to put these images in people's minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, psalm, the psalm really works to unpack or what does it mean for Jesus to hear, you are my beloved son, I have begotten you. And, and the way in which the psalm, uh, now therefore, or kings, be wise, be warned, or rulers of the earth, which takes you mm -hmm. back to Herod. Uh, and and the kind of the kind of opposition, of course, that this kingdom is going to have with the kingdoms of the earth, with the rulers of this earth, and so uh, that and we're reminded that again that this is not um, what what Jesus is proposing is uh, is not what the world wants to hear, you know. And so I think I think the psalm could be really, uh, really helpful in giving the preacher words to bringing, bringing in what we've already heard about what this kingdom of heaven is. And even going back to the birth of Jesus uh, and the story of Herod, it's, uh, which is only in my view that of course, that we get this, uh, this reality of these conflicting kingdoms that, uh, that is a part of, that is, what Jesus, what what Jesus is holding together between the passion prediction and the transfiguration, <laughs> it's. I mean, the the yeah. passion prediction is that the empire strikes back. That's what the empire is going to do, and yeah. and yet we have the transfiguration held right next to it, and that's that's what we're, that's what Jesus lives in, and that's what we live in in part two. Yeah, yeah. It looks yeah, back so to Herod. It looks forward to John too, who's mentioned right. They did to yeah. John whatever they pleased. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's a time of chaos, um, where um, it's a transition, uh, and and it it's a recognition. I guess I I love this idea of using these words from the psalm to describe um, a recognition that. Um, rebellion against God is not a 21st century idea mm -hmm. um, and questioning the identity of Jesus or the role of those who testify to God's promise um, that set across a, a part community who's supposed to be peculiar mm -hmm. among the nations and their peculiarity is because they are seeking after uh, they're seeking to follow God's instructions. They're seeking after the presence of God because of the promises of God. And that, that to do that means that they're going to be peculiar. They're going to be different. They're going to be set apart. Um, but um, it, if, if I turn back to Exodus on that, I think the Psalm and the Exodus uh, um, talk about that, that transitional time where there's a waiting that's happening. So Moses goes up on the mountain after they've been um, um, uh, after they've left one culture and been promised to create and live in a better culture, in a new culture, in a thriving culture, and yet it isn't here yet. Mm -hmm. And that time of waiting that we can clearly see in the Exodus is that time of how we're reading uh, the transfiguration described in Matthew. Mm -hmm. Six days later, we've got this passion prediction, and now we're going to have this moment. And but don't talk about it because we're still in this liminal period. Mm -hmm. And that liminal period to get back to the Psalms is chaos. It's questioning. It's, it's, it's having a promise that isn't real yet mm -hmm. or, or isn't, isn't experienced yet. And I think the Psalm gives us the exact words for that. Mm -hmm. Anything we want to say about second Peter? I see a theme here. This yes. is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. <laughs> yeah. Well, Second Peter is such a weird book, but in the context of this is trust us about the parousia, trust us about Jesus' second coming, because Second Peter seems to be written to people who are starting to give up hope. And the, the answer is you can trust Peter's testimony about the parousia. And Joel Green explains this really well. It's a fine commentary that the whole thing is based on show us a promise that Jesus is going to come back and the author says well Peter saw the transfiguration but the commentary has a line that just stopped me cold when I was reading it and <laughs> Joel, this is probably going to introduce some denominational differences but in the first paragraph if eschatology and ethics 
are woven together, then denying Jesus' future coming pulls the rug out from under the call to faithful living in the present. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's that idea of eschatology and ethics being woven together. Mm -hmm. In other words, where you think the world is headed is going to affect how you should live now. Mm -hmm. This is so funny. This Maybe this is my Presbyterianism. I often talk about how eschatology affects your budget <laughs> in your church <laughs> or how eschatology affects, you know, how you prioritize things in mission. That's what I mean by budget, right? Are you going to put mm -hmm. money into, yeah. into what? What kind of a future are you expecting and are you building toward? Interesting that he uses ethics here, which makes me then the reason it stopped me cold was I wanted to think about that a bit, but I also wanted to think then, so what's what's the ethical impetus of the transfiguration then? Mm. Which is maybe a Methodist question to ask, which is why I'm bringing this up and kind of laughing at uh, at my Lutheran and Methodist friend here. But it's a, it's a question I'm just toying around with in terms mm. of how is this sermon more than just... Uh, Oh, so this is how we transfer into Lent, mm -hmm. <laughs> or this is how our Christology is affected, but how does the transfiguration propel us if it should or if it shouldn't? Well, anyway. I here's your answer. I want, I want answers. That, here, here, I think, yeah, I was really struck by that as well, uh, and that could be a whole, and I really think like eschatology and ethics is like almost like a, a summary of Matthew. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I was yeah, that's where I was going to go. Oh, that's like, whoa, uh, that's what I thought. But I, uh, you know, what what does that mean going into Lent? I actually could come directly from Second Peter. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That it's a, that attentiveness to that glory of God, but that glory of God needs to then reside in your heart. Uh, and that morning star rises in your heart and then your heart becomes that source of, of uh, being the light of the world. I'm really mixing my texts up now, being yeah. the light of the world and being, you know, that, that, that light that you can't hide under a bushel, you know? And so I think that's, uh, it really brings a lot of what we were talking about this whole season full circle. Um, and I think is a really important transition into, uh, into Lent as we imagine, uh, as we imagine again, what does it mean to hold the promise of the resurrection, uh, but the cross at the same time? And uh, and the way in which that has an uh, has an impact on how we you know how we are and who we are. So I you're 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 pushing forward into Lent, and you're also looking back at where yeah. we've been. And I'm gonna I'm gonna look back and say, in the context of where we've come from, in 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 how we've read the the Sermon on the Mount and and all the other texts that we've been reading. There's this setup for this moment mm -hmm. where uh, we've, we've talked about this forming of a community. We've talked about this of uh, uh, this uh, uh, righteousness, justice, this this uh, flourishing of life. Well, I haven't experienced it in, in its fullness. And we talked about that, too. But if in the first century where Peter is uh, written, they were saying, okay, it looks like all these promises of Jesus returning isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so this book has to be written to say, wait a minute, you, these are the things you can hold to because they were witnessed. Well, here we are 2000 years later. Talk about wanting to scratch my head and say, what's this future? Mm -hmm. And and yet it's the same thing. We are holding to the testimony of the past. And, and I'm going beyond in Peter, um, but... Uh, there's another portion of Peter, because Peter is talking about this this all along. There's another portion that says, why is God waiting? But God is waiting because God does not want to lose anyone. Mm. And so this ethic is our living, our participating in um, living by the law, I'm going back to our previous session, living the practices that are life-giving rather than oppressive, 
that are actually bringing the community of flourishing that was the creator's design all the way. And in that, we become the witness. Uh, we are the ones who bear testimony to the promise yet to come, even though we're stuck waiting for when it will yet be. Mm -hmm.